Dr. Samantha Urtenberg, and this is my presentation, Why Not? So a little bit of background. This is part of the last lecture series, and I've received emails and phone calls from people asking if I'm leaving the college. <laughs> or jokingly, Sam, are you dying? What's going on? So just so you know, the last lecture series was actually started by a professor who was dying when he found out he was supposed to give a lecture. And he turned what he was going to say into a book. So there's even more backstory on it. But again, he created this book which inspired the last lecture. And the idea is, what wisdom would you try to impart to the world if you knew it was your last chance? Now, folks, I don't think I have any great wisdom for you. I share that only with my individual classes, right? <laughs> so what I'm going to do, though, is hopefully expand your mind a little bit. Um, provide a little bit of insight, my background, so that you understand how I approach things, maybe inspire you a little bit on how you might approach things, and then share some of the most interesting and impactful stories that I've encountered over my years of teaching, or even before I was teaching, um, and then get you to ask why. That's the essential reason why we're in academics and why we're students, why we're professors, is things are exciting. So say, hey, why does that work that way? Why does that happen that way? Maybe look a little bit further, and then maybe say, why not? Why not tweak this? Why not change that? Why not try something new? So again, asking why. Why does it work that way? And why not try something different? So two major impacts on how I teach and how I approach life. The first one is the idea of a Renaissance man. Has anyone heard the term Renaissance man? Yeah, that idea that you're not just good at one thing, you're willing to look at a little bit of everything. You're not just the math teacher only knowing math. You might know some science and you bring that into the class. You're not just the brilliant student that writes these great English papers. You know a little bit about the science, the history, and you pull that in. So it's seeing the connections of the world. This is what my dad always inspired me to be, to see those connections, um, to not just stay in your own field. That's why my little picture, he's got a record. He's got what looks like a spray can. He's going to sing. He's going to dance. He's going to go run a marathon with me. Mm -hmm. So again, encouraging you not to just stay where you are, but open your field of vision, whether you're a faculty, student, or staff. Now, the second one is from educational methods that I've encountered. My PhD is curriculum and instruction, what to teach and how to teach it. And on one side of the spectrum, I had all these people saying, it's about the numbers, the facts, the figures. Test them. Make sure they know the knowledge. All right, well, maybe the knowledge doesn't stick with you. But then on the other side, it was, we need to make them feel loved. We need to make them feel connected. Everyone's a winner. People, that doesn't really work for me either. I love you, but not everyone's a winner, and we need to learn some actual content. So the person that stuck with me most was Eleanor Duckworth. Real learning, attentive, real learning, deep learning, is playful and frustrating, joyful and discouraging, and exciting and sociable and private, all at the same time, which would which is what makes it great. Now, key things with what she talked about, you got to allow time for confusion. It's not just about, here's the information, spit it back. Here's the article that I read, spit it, spit it back. It's, all right, so what's going on with that math problem? How can I tie it in with the science? What's going on with the article we read in class? Is the research right? You might struggle a little bit because you're applying it. You're not just learning to take the test. And it's OK to struggle, because when you finally truly understand something after you've struggled with it, you have your wonderful ideas. That's that light bulb moment where you're like, ah, I finally get it. I finally get how to write an intro. I finally get how to do that math problem. I finally get how to do that computer system with whatever's changed at FSCJ, right? That light bulb moment where it's real, genuine, and it sticks with you. So that's how I try to approach my classes. That's how I try to approach life. Be willing to struggle. Be willing to have that true learning. And that's why in my classes, I do a lot of news articles. I don't just want to teach you, all right, here's how to write. Here's the form. Let's look at your writing and analyze it. 
We pull in news stories, everything from drones delivering pizzas to new science, technology, innovations, to research studies and the numbers and statistics and if they're valid. Because this way we can see what they're doing. We can analyze it, be interested, be excited, and struggle a little bit, like do we agree with what they did? Why, why not? Where's the conclusion? And then apply it to what we're doing. We can also see the world is really exciting. There's so many things that have changed, so many great news stories. So that's where I'm going to shift now. I'm going to talk about some of the most interesting news stories that I find out there. But I categorized it so that I'm not just telling you, like, New York Times, here's the information for the day. So the first category is about making connections and really trying to encourage you to be that Renaissance person and see all those connections. So has anyone heard of Phineas Gage, neuroscience's most famous patient? See any science people here? No, that's the problem. This is one of the most exciting science stories that I ever encountered. Um, and it was before I was even a teacher. And I developed a curriculum for Girls Incorporated, a science curriculum, talking about this guy. So we're talking 1848. This guy is 25 years old. He's doing something with the railroad, and he takes this pole that's 43 inches long, 1.25 inches in diameter, 13.25 pounds, and he packs it in um, with explosions. He packs this pole with explosions, and it goes off too soon. So this pole goes through his cheek and out through his head. OK, we're thinking 1848, he should be dead. But he survives. And he's aware enough that he goes, hey, doctor, here's business enough for you. Seriously, I'd be a little bit more serious with my doctor. Like, get this out. But you don't have to just understand how the brain works to appreciate this story. There's psychology aspects. Like, his personality changed. He lived another 10 plus years, but he wasn't Phineas Gage anymore. So look at the psychology, the sociology, the medical history, because it's really cool to see these stories from those different perspectives. Another story for you, a couple of them read this great book, Bellevue, Three Centuries of Medicine and Mayhem in America's Most Storied Hospital. Any book that has mayhem, I'm all about it. So it takes us back to the time before we knocked people unconscious before surgery. Right? You're just there getting yourself cut open, screaming, aware of everything that's going on. And it takes someone to go, why are we doing it this way? Why not try something different so that maybe you're unconscious as we're cutting into you or we're resetting that leg break? So again, asking why, why not? So finally, we have a way to knock people out, 1846. Then the idea of germ theory. People, we didn't have the microscopes a long time ago. We didn't know these little things were around that we needed to just wash our hands. So they start coming up with the idea of germ theory, like why are people dying after surgeries? It takes Lister, who develops this solution so that we can spray it over the wound, killing the germs. So why is there a problem? Why is this happening? And why not try something different to solve it? And now, one more story related to medicine and health. Um, we're going to go to Coney Island, New York, right? We're end of the 1800s, start of 1900s. There's rides. There's the sideshow people, you know, the woman with the beard, the flame eater, and babies in incubators. Babies in incubators at a sideshow? Believe it or not, there's a whole book written about this guy. Um, Miracle of Coney Island, how a sideshow doctor saved thousands of babies and transformed American medicine. A hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago, newborn babies that came out too early, preemies, they weren't worth saving. They were weaklings. Why spend the time or money to save them? Over in Europe, they started doing the incubations, right? These little things to help the baby survive. America wasn't having that at the time. So this guy, he couldn't put in the hospital a neonatal care center. He made a sideshow out of it, charging people to come see these really tiny babies. And he helped them survive. The parents didn't have to pay because he charged money. So if you go back with this story, you could say it takes this guy going, hey, why not try what they're doing in Europe? Hey, if they're not going to let me do it in the hospital, why not try it here? The other interesting thing is, 
we're not so sure about this guy, this doctor, because he changed his name several times. They're not even sure if he really had a degree. But why not? If he's making this difference, why not give it a try? So interesting stories. And the thing is, you don't have to be a science person to in, like those stories. You can see it from the psychology side, from the history side, sociology. And of course, we need someone like these wonderful people in my class, right, to write the stories to make them interesting for us. So see those connections. And you're not going to solve the problem unless you see the connections. With our iPhones now, right, it didn't just take the technology. It took the person understanding psychology and sociology to say, how will we use the phones? I remember at one point they were trying to make cell phones smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. They're like, wait, if we make them bigger and use them for a different method, why not? So you don't have to be a scientist to like science things. Most recent favorite book, Get Well Soon, History of Plagues. Now, isn't that exciting? Mm -hmm said, whether plagues are managed quickly doesn't just depend on hardworking doctors and scientists. It depends on people who like to sleep in on the weekends and watch movies and eat French fries and do the fantastic common things in life. Whether a civilization fails well during a crisis has a great deal to do with how the ordinary, non-scientist citizen responds. So again, don't be afraid to look at that science article in the news, the technology article, because again, you're making those connections and it's part of your life. You can just approach it from different ways. So that's category one for you. And you can say, woo, wow, sideshow babies. <laughs> and then say, why? Why is this happening? Use a little bit of your technology to find out more information. But then say the connections and say, well, why not? Why not try something differently? Why not, in my field, use technology in order to look at grants from a different way? Why not use my technology to communicate in a different way? Category number two, perspective. I love talking about perspective in my classes. So when you see this, what's the first thing you see? So some people see the white, which is a cup. Some people see the black, which is a face with the nose and the mouth. Some of you guys have seen this, and do you see that? So if you look at the black, there's faces, nose, mouth. Otherwise, it's a cup. Here's the, gonna hold it here, drink it. I really wanna emphasize to you that we are all looking from a different perspective, and we don't even realize it. So we say, well, that's just how it's done, but it's because you're standing in that particular position, and to see the connections of the world, we need to understand our perspective. I told you Renaissance person here, right? So we're gonna go a little bit of artwork now as well. M.C. Escher, one of my favorite artists, he has it so that the white starts filtering into the white birds, the black starts filtering in the black birds. It's how you look at it, where your eye starts, how it flows. Perspective is key. Another one. Okay, so this guy here is walking down the stairs. This guy here, he's walking down the stairs, but from his perspective, he's upside down. Right? This guy's sitting here and should fall off unless I kind of lean a different way. Right? It's all about perspective and seeing we're looking from a certain angle. Even if you say this is the dominant angle, we're all supposed to look this way. Yeah, maybe some people are looking a little sideways. Maybe some people are a little different in how they're seeing it. So if you want to look more about Escher, again, be a Renaissance person, look him up later. I try to use a lot of perspective and opinion in my class because it's fun to see those connections. Um, there was an actual article. The guy came in with do not resuscitate tattooed across his chest. OK, so he's not breathing. Do you take this as a do not resuscitate order? Or is it just a tattoo? If you look at it legally, it's one thing. Ethically, from the patient's perspective versus the family's perspective, they actually had to do something and decide what to do at that moment. And I'm not going to tell you what they did because I encourage you to go, why? And look up more. You can easily Google, do not resuscitate tattoo. Another topic that we talk about sometimes is um, one coach was fired because he was an alcoholic. California law claims that's a disability. So are things like alcoholism a disability? Is it a lot with personal choice? Is it a medical issue? Same thing with ideas with obesity. Is it a medical thing and we should treat it with dollars? Or is it something 
personal responsibility. It all depends on your perspective. And as much as you say, gosh darn it, this is the answer, somebody else might be looking from a historical perspective, a psychology perspective, a legal perspective, and that changes how it works. So always look at what perspective you're looking at and say, why do we think, feel, act, decide that way? And then why not take a new perspective or approach something in a new way? It might be a work issue. Well, this is how we do it at FSCJ. Why not try to tweak that method? Change it around, approach it from a different way at the beginning or towards the very end. Challenge our assumptions out there. Again, don't challenge the world, but try to make it better by being creative, being innovative. All right, third category for you, static. The idea that things are that way and they're never gonna change. We came into the building today, right? We had the stairs, we had the windows, pretty common building format. We have the air conditioner or the heater, which sometimes doesn't work, right? But that's the basic function of the building. Why? One article, Building the Suppression of Seasonal Response and the Effects of Health, says why not make the building something more? The function of a building is to provide not just shelter and comfort, but to actively promote a healthy physiology. Design and control of the building environment can significantly impact health, an engineered health environment. So instead of just heat and cold, why not pump in oxygen, especially in high altitude places? There's one company that's doing that in the high altitude places, saying it's making their employees function better to have that oxygen going. Why not maybe put in some vitamins or something in the air? Why do we just assume that that's the way it is and that's how a building is built? Why not tweak something a little bit? Um, seasonal affective disorder, right? It gets so dark in the winter and we get all depressed, especially if you go north and they have no sunlight. Some people are challenging the fact that that has to happen. How to get back that extra hour of sunlight? Um, hate long winter nights, a simulated sun session could lift your spirits. Some buildings are putting in sunrooms with the flowers so that you feel energized, engaged. Will Norway ever beat the winter blues? Scandinavia uses giant mirrors, light therapy clinics, and even positive thinking to overcome seasonal depression disorder. So why, just because it's the way we're doing it and it's the environment we're in, why not change that environment a little bit? Hundert Wasser, again, we had some art, we have all kinds of stuff. Here we go to architecture. He's one of the architects that I know because he said, my feet get tired of walking in a straight line. My eyes get tired of just looking at straight lines. So I know my doors and my windows need to be straight for structure, but why not paint them a little bit differently? Why not make the facade a little bit different? Why not include our friends of green? Right? So him having the structure that's there, but playing around and saying, let's try a little something different. Here's another one of his. Again, the structure is there if you look at the individual windows and the doors, but he lets our eyes play, our feet walk a little bit differently. Bigger environment. Here we go, Pittsburgh, 1940s. This is the middle of the day, and they had to turn on lamps because it was so polluted that they couldn't see what was going on. People wore one shirt to work and it was so dirty they had to switch shirts while at work and then wear that other dirty shirt home. And that was just the way things were. Chicago had the same thing going on and someone said it looked like the smoke ate the sun. Why not say we can have business and we can have an environment at the same time and now it's a clean city where they've got green things growing on the walls of buildings. So again, just because that's the way it is, we think it's static, our environment, the buildings, the world around us, maybe it doesn't have to be. Why not even take it one step further and go to the moon? If anyone read The Martian, the movie Matt Damon, right? You've read that, I know, part of book club, right there. Um, he wrote another book, Andy Ware, called Artemis, and he decided to make you know, a colony on the moon. And the whole last part of the book, he talks about how fun it was to really think about what he would need to do to make a colony on the moon. How would they get the resources? How would they make it so that if there was a disaster, they would be able to survive? How could they make an economy? So again, it might seem really sci-fi, but he broke it down to say, why not try it? Here's some of the things we would have to do. He even calculated how much money you would need to charge people to get there based on fuel cost and all of that. So again, 
I just emphasize why. Why are things the way they are and why not try something a little bit different? I'm not saying design a whole building, but you can maybe just change the environment around you a little bit. All right, and then the last category, dynamic. We had static, not moving. Now dynamic, moving, ever-changing. And one of my favorite articles, did you know up until the 1940s, Americans didn't even get tornado forecasts? We couldn't say tornado in the forecast because they were afraid people would panic. Right? They were like, tornado, and at that point they couldn't pinpoint them, so everyone would be in an uproar. People would be stuck in their you know, shelters not knowing what to do. It took changes in technology and techno our communication for us to start using the term tornado. Now we don't even think about it. We've got all this information, too much information on the TV almost. But things change. The way we use words change. The way we connect as a community also changes. I've known this article for a while, but I thought it was really cool because going back to my Get Well Soon, again, History of Plagues, they were talking about the flu pandemic of eight, uh, 1918, Spanish influenza. A third of the world was infected. A third of the world, people, that's a lot. 50 million people died. And we're not just talking the young and the old. This struck people in the prime. Like we're talking 20-year-old strapping young men. We're going down with this. Life expectancy in the U.S. dropped by 12 years. I mean, that's a huge drop. And yet, interesting things, most of us have never heard of it, right? We're like, what, what was that? But the other thing is called the Spanish influenza. Now, why would you think it's called Spanish influenza? Anyone willing to guess for me? Did it originate in Spain? And that's what we would think, right? <laughs> And I love that you say that because that's what we would assume, but actually it was here in America, but we had something called the moral law. 20 years in jail if you utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the government of the United States. Now this wasn't specifically about the government, but they were worried to print it because maybe the government might imply we're handling it wrong or show there's something wrong going on. So right here in America, and they're not really publishing about it. People are dying, but they're not saying that much. Same thing in England. They were afraid to print it, so it ended up being the Spanish flu because they were the first to really print it and talk about it. So again, I saw that. Hmm, fascinating. I want you to see that the way we use language, the way we use math or science, it changes. It is dynamic. And just because we think, hey, that's how we know now, might have been different 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago. Might be different in another 20 years. We can be the ones that change how it's used. So we're part of history. People from the past weren't the two-dimensional black and white photos or line drawings you might encounter in some dry textbook. They were living, breathing, joking, burping. People who could be happy or sad, funny or boring, cool or the lamest person you ever met in your life. They had no idea they were living in the past. And that's from the Get Well Soon book. Just like right now, we don't realize we're going to be part of the past. So how are you going to make a difference with that? How are you going to impact it? We used to have the telephone, right? This kind of telephone, hello, right? Then we advanced because someone said, why do we need to be connected by wires? Then again, we connect because someone said, why not use it for more than making phone calls and texting? Asking the question of, well, why is it that way? And why not try something different? You might be the next person that does the Amazon or eBay, right? Why do we have to do face-to-face -face selling? Why not change the way we bank, we buy things? Use the technology, and you don't have to be the tech expert. You might have the idea, and then you connect with someone over there that has the tech expert of it, and then you make the ideas come alive. If you're the Renaissance person, you can see the connections and you can see the people you need to talk to. Why not make the greatest show I think that has ever existed, The Masked Singer? Right? It used to just be we would sing, then we got into competitions of who could sing, then we got into competitions so we could vote. Now we don't really care about the singing, we're trying to guess who is the one singing. Great show by the way, right? The celebrities, they're terrible and it doesn't matter, it's not really about the singing. It's about the guessing. It's about the voting. It's about knowing culture. 
the community, the sociology of what people are interested in. So again, realize there's a lot more than sometimes at first glance. And one of my students told me about this two weeks ago. An automatic um, chest compressor. Did not know about that. Well, you know, I knew that you could like shock them, charge. But now you can go and put this on so that the EMTs can be doing other things. It took someone saying, why do we have a person doing this? Okay, I know we need to do it. I'm going to connect them with my tech person to design it. Then we're going to practice it. We're going to get it all approved and stuff. Making those connections, not just within your mind, but with other people. So folks, to kind of wrap stuff up, since I know some of you have a one o'clock class or appointment at one, be a Renaissance person. Find those connections. Don't not read the article because it's listed in the text section. Read it and get the basic understanding. Look at the history. Look at the science. Look at how great the English people are for writing about it, right? And then ask why. Again, you might not be trying to change the world, but you're expanding your own mind and seeing the world is really cool as things change, as information comes out. And then ask that why not. Why not make a tweak here? Why not if I want to go into the medical field, why not work in the lab as opposed to becoming a doctor? Why not see the other progressions that I can make as I go along? And then try something new. You might change the whole world for all we know, but you also might just change your own world and make it a better, more exciting place. So again, I challenge you to ask why, and then maybe ask why not. Thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>